In 2024, the MG brand turned 100 years old. And over the past century, it's fair to say that the brand has evolved quite a lot from where it first started. It's always been seen as a sort of performance, sort of like sporting brand for the everyday man or woman. But since it was relaunched back into Europe under Chinese ownership, they seem to have shifted their focus away from providing sort of like performance cars, providing good value for money, everyday sort of cars for everyday sort of people. Now that's not necessarily a bad thing because since the brand relaunched itself in Europe again under its Chinese ownership, it's been a real success story. And its HS, its largest sort of like crossover, is the one that's regularly featured in the UK's best-selling top 10 car sales chart. And that's despite the fact that whilst it offered a lot of value for money, it fell short of class best, maybe when it came to things such as design, uh, quality, and dare I suggest the way it drove. But MG doesn't sit still for long, and it wants to make sure that it has all those other boxes ticked as well, because now, there's a new one. Welcome to this week's new car review. Welcome to the newly revised MG HS. Please sit yourself down, make yourself comfortable in the house of cars. Now, before I start on this week's review of MG's new HS, it's time for me to get a little bit cheeky with you. If you're not already a subscriber to the House of Cars channel, would you please consider becoming one? Please? Then once you've done that, make sure you press the little bell button that's down there because that's the way you get notified when the next video is uploaded and it's gone live. After you've watched it, if you enjoy it, and I hope you do, make sure you give it a little thumbs up here. And don't forget, let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. Let me know what you think about the cars that we feature on House of Cars, such as the new MGHS, and of course, on the channel as a whole. So, the HS. A considerable success story for MG since it relaunched back into Europe. Um, one of the fastest growing car brands in Europe, uh, and, and, and this was part of the success story, with the HS being a regular uh, in the UK's top 10 best selling cars. And it was the company's first plug in hybrid as well. And it was easy to see the appeal with the HS because it offered what most families, dare I suggest, need. Maybe not so much want, but certainly what they need in the terms of it was a spacious and comfortable family crossover that was well equipped fairly decent to drive and came with a good warranty and didn't cost the earth to buy in the first place. That being said, it wasn't exactly perfect. Styling was a bit bland and you know there's maybe some quality around the car you could maybe sort of like say well that's not as good as the competition and that's where MG sort of like stu stood up and took some notice because they don't want to be seen as a budget brand they want to be seen as a contemporary just like everyone else and that's where this new car comes in they've taken it and they've changed a lot of things about it not just sort of like giving it a bit of a facelift there's a lot changed in this car and there's a lot to like but does it stand comparison with everything else that's out there in what is a very competitive market space? However, as always before we start, let's take a brief snapshot about what the MG HS is all about. Well, this second generation HS is now slightly larger than the previous car, with a longer wheelbase for better interior space. At first, just a petrol and plug-in hybrid are offered, although a mild hybrid is due to join the range in 2025. In the petrol engine car, you get a choice of manual or automatic transmissions. There are two trim levels to choose from. And prices start from just £25,000 for the lead-in petrol model. So just £25,000 for a spacious, well-equipped family crossover from a recognisable brand that comes with a seven-year warranty. Done deal then. Not necessarily. But let's put it through a House of Cars road test review and find out. Okay, design. Apology from me. Now, if you're a regular viewer of House Cars, thank you, by the way, uh, it's much appreciated, uh, and you watched my previous twin test between the MG3 and the Skoda Fabia, I did say about the little Super Mini, I went, oh, I'm not really sure about the styling of that car. I know it doesn't really tie in with the MG family. <coughs> little did I know that was the sort of start of it, if you like. They, and I think the sort of, what they've done in terms of that style, translating into the bigger SUV works better in the bigger cars in some respects. I think this is a handsome looking car. I think it's really nice looking this. Um, let's start 
car to the front, obviously, you get this black strip that runs, that just joins um, the two swept back LED matrix headlights, which are lovely. I really like those and the good vision you get from them. And see just that black strip that runs across there and just it gives it a little bit of separation there which I like. You get the big MG octagon which would normally used to sit down in the grill is now moved up onto the nose cone so it's not on the bonnet it's just in front of the leading edge of the bonnet just there and that sits nice and proud and chrome. Lovely big open grill area here. Normally some of these big open grills I think can look a little bit gauche um, on SUVs but here I think it works, I think it's just the right size um, and the tech in it is quite neatly hidden so there's a little camera mounted in there, the radar sensor for the, the front mounted cruise control that's down there and the parking sensors are neatly integrated into the grill as well. The only slight thing that irks me a little bit is um, where you think there's a bit of aero work going on there, it's not, it's a fake vent, it's just filled in and I do find that a bit, if that had just been opened up that might have helped with the airflow around the car. I don't know why I didn't do that, MG, but it's nice enough. Low set fog lights there. A little bit of sort of like crisscross hatching again, a sort of fake vent that's not there. And then down at the bottom, another area cooling there with a nice contrasting front splitter. I like these little sort of like almost like dive plane bits and body colour there. I think that's nice. So yeah, I think we're off to a good start and I think it's a good looking car in what can be quite a bland market space. Right, this is where you'll start to see little bits I think of other manufacturers just creep in. So see, it's not a blatant copy, but things will just make you think, oh, that looks like a insert name of brand here. I think there's a tiny little bit of Lexus going on at that front end there. Just with these, can I say, the lovely lights that sweep back in there and that sharp pointed nose. They, the bonnet, the way it hits the top of this wing has got a really nice sharp edge to it and it runs along right into the doors and gives a good strong character shoulder line until it then just disappears in the rear wing. But then you have this bulging uh, area here that then comes into another sharp line that sweeps around into the rear end to, like across the back of the tailgate. That's nice, I like that, that's good. Strong um, wheel arches here, see how they, they've got the circular bit at the top that just then doubles up this line here and then of course you get the gloss black extensions there but they're dipped in a little bit, it's almost a little bit of negative space there, just like it is there. It'd be difficult to see at that angle, but that I think works really, really nicely. You get this flying kind of wing strake here, if you like, not unlike Aston Martin, <clears throat> except there's no grill there, but it has got a little, um, a little camera embedded in there, it helps with the 360 degree parking camera. Um, and then the contrasting sort of like black down at the bottom, but with a little bit of sort of like almost kind of carbon fibre type material just above it, just to give it a little bit of texture and make it look a little bit different. Um, so I do like that, as I say, that's a nice bit of styling cue uh, when the cars see. A bit Lexus at the, at, at, at the front there, a little bit of Aston there. Of course, you get your big standout door mirrors with another camera there. Um, 19 inch wheels are standard across the range, across two models, so they're standard on the car as well. Um, nice chunky standout door handles, keyless entry as well, so you've got the little buttons there for the keyless entry, privacy glass on this one as well, satin chrome roof rails that come across the top and it's this rear end here that is the one that sort of like just brings me in mind and you'll see it more when we go around the back but there's almost a little hint of Jaguar F-Pace there and Audi Q8, that's what I think. Just with this, the slope of this pillar, just this rear three quarter section here just reminds me of the Jaguar F-Pace and Audi Q8. It's not a blatant copy and it's not a criticism because I think it w looks good but it's just what it reminds me of. But yeah, I think it's a handsome looking car. Let's take a look around the back end now. See what I mean about that line there? Does it not remind you of Jaguar F-Pace there? Um, there's that line, as I say, that runs across and gives a nice sharp uh, sort of like rear deck, if you like, that runs into that other wing there. That's nice with the Chrome MG badge there. Your obligatory light bar that runs across, some nice sort of like rear lamps to the car, subtle badging, you just get the big Chrome MG badge there and then the HS logo there. So there's no nomenclature in terms of other, other engine size or anything like that. MG HS, that's it. Good uh, roof spoiler there. They've got a little bit of just sort of like a little bit of, of, of a dip at the back there, again, just to help with the airflow management. Nice uh, rear, uh, rear wash wipe there. You get the high level rear brake light inside the rear screen like you did with the MG3. But again, there's a little, there's a little, is that the washer up there? That's the washer up there, yeah, there you go. Because the camera's underneath here. 
difficult to find the handle at first. It's, it's, it's not quite where you expect to find it. It's just to the right, and it's just slightly towards the leading edge of that bit of trim there. But that's where the boot uh, button is. Um, and then at the bottom, there's a bit of a kind of diffuser type of situation going on there with parking sensors. And then, of course, you get what look like exhausts um, there, but they're not. They're just grills. The exhaust obviously exits underneath the car as well. So, on the whole, I think a good looking car. As I say, there's elements of other cars around it, but I don't think it's a blatant copy. I think it's a nice little sort of like design touches they've had, and it just brings me to mind those other uh, cars. But if you're thinking of Jaguar, Lexus, Aston Martin, um, you know, Audi, let's be fair, that's not bad company to be reminded of, if you like, with your styling. But what do you, th it's certainly more distinctive than the old HS, don't you think? I mean, have you got an old HS? Do you like the look of this new one? Do you prefer your one? Did you not buy an HS just purely because you didn't get on with the way it looks? Would this new one tempt you? Let me know, as always, in the comment section down below. Right, practicality wise. I see the car has grown in size. Um, 507 litres of boot space now. Um, which is which is good, you know, that's, that's fine. I've got four suitcases in there. I've got the big one right at the back there. You get the medium one down the side. Two carry-ons there, as you can see, plus my camera rucksack just in the corner there. So that is a good size of boot, albeit it is smaller than you get in, say, the Hyundai Tucson, which is a car that we featured the other week, which is obviously a car in this class as well. Um, you can split fold the 6040 rear seats as well, and that'll take total capacity up to 1,484 litres. Um, you'll also notice there was an electric tailgate, um, but that's only on the trophy model, which this one is. You don't get that on, on an SE. Still, first world problem if you have to live a tailgate on your own. But it's a decent amount of space, a decent amount, I would suggest, for a family, in terms of if you're going away on holiday, or if you've, you know, your weekly shop, or you know whatever it is that you do, push chairs, buggies, that type of thing, you're going to get them in there. There's no underfloor storage, however. There's nothing underneath the, the boot floor of the car. There's a couple of little pockets at the side with nets in it, and that's your lot. But I would say, in terms of whilst it's not the biggest in the class, it's far from the worst, and it's going to suit most families' needs, I would suggest. Okay, how does it fare for rear room? Well, it fares really well, I think, because what you have here is almost a flat floor right across. So getting three sat here isn't going to be a problem in terms of room that way. Maybe in terms of shoulder room if they're adults, but certainly three kids, not a problem at all. Not a problem at all. And actually sitting sort of like on this side behind the seat, which is set up for myself, I have absolutely bags of space. Good knee room, lots of foot room. I can get my feet right under the driver's seat and I've got good headroom. No sunroof in the car. But there you go. I mean, I like a sunroof, maybe some people don't. But it does mean as well that helps with headroom. It's all right for me. Again, you know, I suppose if you're maybe a six foot, you know, rugby player or whatever, you're over six foot, you might find it just starting to encroach in, but it doesn't feel like it would. And with the light headlining that's equipped in the car as well, it feels much more open in terms of its space. So that's excellent. I have to say, good amount of uh, room back here. Then there's some deep door bins. They're not very long, but they are deep, so they'll take a water bottle. There's mat pockets in the backs of the front seats, as you would expect. There's two USB A ports down there with a face vent. And you also have a fold down armrest with two cup holders with, you know, that's, that's sort of like um, framed with that gloss. I don't like the glossy black plastic, but it's nice to see. It feels a bit more premium. And that's what I'm talking about. There's a lot of premium feeling materials in the car now. Um, so that does help as well. Um, the Isofix points, um, outer seats, they are just the points that are sort of like between uh, the backrest and the squab. So you just got to jab the, the prongs of the seat in there. So that's probably not the best solution um, because you might end up damaging sort of like um, the seat material. But otherwise, you know, it's got them and it, at least they're there. And there's certainly enough room here. If you're one of those bulky ones, you know, you can swing it round, one of those rear facing ones that's good. So good amount of foot room, decent um, headroom. I think it's probably going to be all right for width. There's probably enough storage for most families' needs not overburdened with it. There's connectivity, albeit it is USB -A, uh, points there. No sunroof, but other than that, it's a, a good, spacious, subtle space for a young family. Right, 
up front. Oh, by the way, if you see a little familiar face, I've got Finley with me today. So he's out helping me film, aren't you, buddy? But don't worry, he's in his nice big booster seat here, so he's not marking the, the seat or anything like that, but he's with me helping me out, aren't you, buddy? Right, new um, up front. This is really, really nice up here, I have to say. Um, it feels just a little bit more cohesive in its design, a little bit better in the quality of the materials that they've used. Um, still not perfect, there's still a way to go for NG, but I tell you what, it's way better than when they first started. And when they first started um, back with, you know, the ZS and the, you know, the MG4 and such like, you know, they weren't bad actually, um, but there is a big improvement uh, up here. So let's start with the main event, which is obviously these twin screens here. So you get two 12.3 inch screens, one in front of you is the driver here, and then your infotainment screen here. Now this was always an area, not of concern, but an area of criticism, if you like, because it was a bit laggy, it was a bit slow. Um, it is better, but it is still a little bit laggy and a little bit slow. They are getting there, okay? So it is better to use, but it still isn't up to class best um, in terms of, you know, sort of like how quick and how responsive that it is. I've seen a couple of times when it's needed, you know, a couple of pushes on certain sort of like icons down the side there for me to actually get it or certainly a real firm push. And you can see how long it takes for things to kind of come up there. See, look, there's the icon. It's taken me two presses to get that up. So, as I say, it, it's still, there's still a way to go, MG, but, but it is better, that's what I will say. It has Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, but it's not wireless. And I do believe, from what I've been hearing, you need to have a very good quality cable. So be aware of that, um, for that point of view. There's no wireless charging on the lead-in car, but there is on this trophy, which is just tucked underneath this armrest here. Um, but obviously, if you need to plug it in for Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, it'll charge your phone anyway. So there is that side of it, uh, not to worry too much about. But as I say, at least you get the Apple Cup and Android Auto, but it would be nice to see it wireless, perhaps. You obviously get Bluetooth, um, you get an inbuilt navigation system. You see what I mean? You just gotta give it a, a couple of prods before it all starts. Um, you know, and then they obviously, depending obviously on what you want, um, 3D heading up, 2D heading up, 2D north. Um, it just needs a good firm prod with your finger to make it all work. But, as I say, it's better. 360 degree, oh, come on. 360 degree parking camera. Remember, I'll show you the cameras outside. Um, so there you go, that's excellent, you know, so it's good that you've got that. You can see all around the car, which is excellent. So that's there. And then you have this screen in front of you now as the driver, which, um, is integrated now. It used to be uh, the previous cars had a little separate screen and I was always quite critical of them because they crammed a lot of information into them. It's nicely spaced out here and it's very very easy to read. It is very very easy to see what you have here. So you've got like an information screen if you like centered down the side here um, where you can uh, ask it to show you different things so like multimedia, uh, route guidance, uh, trip computer, um, you, you know, averages, things there, and tire pressure uh, monitoring system there. On the left hand side here, it's to do with your uh, active safety systems, you know, so your lane keep assist, uh, your cross traffic alert, all that type of thing, your emergency brake assist, all that's there. And then in the centre, what you then have is a nice and clear speedometer readout with the speed limit warning there. Right, there's two things that really, really bug me about this car. Um, um, and I am going to point the finger at MG for this in some respects because, as you know, I'm one of these people, you're probably the same, that doesn't like all these safety systems interrupting. It finds them a bit of a nuisance. So you do want to turn them off. So you've got to go into this screen to turn them off. Now, um, you can, if you go into car settings there, there's your MG Pilot, which I think, if I remember correctly, it's part of that. There you go. Speed limit recognition. Do you see what I mean? Because you've got you've got to swipe it across. So because you turn it all off, it, it's not as responsive a screen as you'd like. It takes longer. And that causes the biggest problem of them all because as you can see, it has this on the A-pillar, which is the driver monitoring system. So if you're taking your eyes off the road, it beeps at you. And by God, does it beep at you. And it constantly, and I mean, like you, you know, I reached across just to give Finlay a little, little pat on the head this morning. It started at me and didn't stop. 
it, you immediately take your eye off the road and that thing starts up. It's really annoying. Um, and, and as I say, why then bury stuff there if you're going to have that? I mean, it really, oh, it's so annoying. It's really, really bad. I don't think that's a good thing at all. In fact, where is it? Driver fatigue monitoring. Monitoring. Driver distraction monitoring. So it's right down the bottom of that screen. And look, you've got a really... And then you've got to say, yes, I do want to turn it off. So you've got all those different steps through a screen that's not particularly responsive. Whether you have to use, but as soon as you use it, that tells you off for using it. It's nuts. I really don't like that. That's really annoying. And as I say, even, you, you know, unless you are absolutely dead ahead, it's, you know, you look, you check the time or something, the time's way up there, just something simple like that, it will go bonkers at you. MG, that's poor. I don't like that at all. The rest of the cabin, however, is really good. You know, you get this nice sort of like shelf area here that's got the padded leatherette. It's not obviously real leather, it's imitation leather. You've got some shortcut buttons in terms of heated rear screen, full defrost, hazard, switching the, the fan on and off, and then just a home button there, which is, you know, which is good there. And they are nicely designed into it. So, uh, you know, there are some physical buttons, but it'd be nice if you had one of the one, one physical button turn that bloody thing off. That would be great. I'd love that. Um... Storage, you've got oh, two cup holders down here, USB-A connectivity, so they've not gone USB-C, but that's down there, but there you go, you can still get your, your, your coffee flask and your water bottle neatly in there, too much of this glossy black plastic again, but that's just a personal choice, um, you've got a nice tran auto transmission lever here, this also, the car's also in automatic, uh, with a park button, um, electronic park brake, auto hold and hill descent control button there. Familiar MG steering wheel now, which is that slightly squared off one, so you do, you get a good view of the screen. Um, you know, most people I would think in terms of the driving position will get a good view of the screen, so nothing's really interrupted by it, and it feels nice in your hand. I always said, with MGs, you, you know, th there's a lot of them felt almost like old generation Audi, Volkswagen stuff, and that's one of the areas where you feel, this, if you're used to sort of like the thickness of an old kind of Audi steering wheel with the perforated sections, uh, you know, at quarter to nine, that's what it will remind you of. And it's a nice three spoke design that's really nice to hold. The the indicator stocks and the wiper stocks again remind me of the old Audi ones as well, and they are right behind. It's probably because SAIC, the own MG, had a manufacturing agreement without Volkswagen Group. I think they manufactured Volkswagen and Audis in China uh, for for a Volkswagen Group. So I'm pretty sure that might have been part of the deal to get some of their old equipment. But they work really well and they're nice. They've got a really nice positive feel to them there's just enough buttons on the steering wheels as you know you can assign a couple of favorites on these stars but not as many things as you think you can i think there's only two or three things you can assign to these if i press that that's the, the car, front parking car, the 360 degree parking camera what does that one do hang on take me back to home what does that one have been assigned to anything yet? Yeah, just your music system. I think there's only about three things each you can do with them. And you're limited with what you can do, which is slightly annoying. But anyway, they're nice to use, they're nice to hold. And you've got a button there for adjusting what you can see on this info system here. And then for your lane keep assist and then your voice activation. And obviously then your Bluetooth. Track search and uh, cruise control and volume on are, are, are there as well. And these silver toggles. Physical buttons, easy to use, fall nicely to hand. Uh, switch pack on the door is the four electric windows and the nice um, uh, switch pack for your electric mirrors. There's a tiny little uh, drop down storage console there and you get electric seats on this trophy model. Um, there's more storage just in the centre console there as this is behind this wireless charging pad and then the last thing to really discuss is the seats. They're, they're actually very comfortable. I'm about to go and do a reasonable drive in this car now once I finish this film and I have to admit driving it around this week has been quite nice. They're just right I think. They could do maybe, in fact actually no, I'd be, been, I'd be splitting hairs if I said they needed a bit more support underneath the thigh. They don't. They're quite nice. They are a bit soft. You know, the material and the cushioning in them is a little bit soft. Um, but it does hold you reasonably well. You, you, you can't fail to get a good driving position, really, in the car. There is reach and brake adjustment of the steering wheel. And as I say, 
you know, it, pretty much I think most people will get a good clear view of that. And you do sit nice and high in the car. You can see the extremities of it. Nice big door mirrors. I really like the door mirrors. They're nice and big. And you get the blind spot uh, lights in them as well. You know, if something's coming through your blind spot. So, on the whole, I think it's a really nice interior. I really like it. The materials are good for class. Other people do do it better, but I'm not going to criticise uh, MG too much for it because I think they've improved a lot. That's still a bit laggy. That's, you know, I think we're going to see maybe next gen car. You look at something like the Hyundai Tucson, uh, the Renault Astral, you know, with its Google based operating system, things like that, you know, they're much better. Um, that's still a bit, you know, as you've got to really press it to make it work. But at least it has all the functionality there. Yes, it would be nice to see wireless Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, but, you know, the beggars can't be choosers. But remember, as I say, use a good quality wire. I'm told using a, a, a cheap cable doesn't work particularly well with it, so make sure you do that. This is much better in here. This is a nicer dashboard design here. Overall, the comforts there, the space is there, but that absolutely drives me insane. The, the, the whole safety system thing, having to go through all that malarkey to turn this thing off now, as I say, it beeps at you. As soon as you move your eye, that's it. It's off. It's scolding you like you're a naughty schoolboy, and it's horrible. It really is. Um, there is a swipe down there where you do some slightly shorter cut things to things, but it's things like, you know, the brightness and the, and the multimedia volume and the Bluetooth and the ESC. So you still have to go through all of that malarkey to get to those safety systems so that is a real and it, it really does stand it, it, it's a real black mark i think for the car it really is i don't like it um and it's really really irritating because you have to remember to turn it off before you set off because they say if you do it when you're driving oh all hell breaks loose other than that it's a good interior isn't it finley we like it don't we yeah buddy right time to talk engines now Ooh, I hear you all say, but listen, first before we get started, that's structural. Right, that's fine. Uh, right, uh, engines. At the moment, uh, you, 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 it's, it's all petrol, that's what you get. Um, and it's either this one here, which is the, the base 1.5 litre four cylinder turbo unit. Um, okay, so that produces 167 brake horsepower um, and 270. Newton meters of torque, okay? So that's the engine that's in this particular car. Now, it either comes with a manual or an automatic, well, a DCT gearbox, uh, that you get that. However, um, if you choose the plug in hybrid option, the power jumps to 303 brake horsepower um, and 430 Newton meters of torque, which really helps with the performance of this car. That's superb, that really has. Now, the other thing as well is with the plug-in hybrid of the car, um, it has a usable capacity of the battery, 23 kilowatt hours. That's exceptionally good. That's really good. Um, better than the, the Passat uh, hybrid, you know, e-hybrid estate that I reviewed the other week. That's exceptional. Um, but they say 75 miles of, of electric-only driving. Now, given how good MG's electric cars are, that's quite confidence-inspiring, and that's obviously going to help you uh, if you're a company car driver. So the plug-in hybrid is... There's a couple of things going for that, obviously, in terms of the performance and in terms of taxational benefits if you're a company car user. Um, and it, it, if you're just a, 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 you know, a small mileage user, you know, you may find that the car runs around mostly on the time on electric power, so it keeps your running costs down. There you go. Um, what was I talking about? Oh, the other thing as well is with the plug-in hybrid, it's got vehicle to load as well. So that's quite handy as well. Um, now, I was mentioning company car drivers there. If you are a company car driver, that plug-in hybrid has the emission ratings of just 12 grams per kilometre of CO2. So that's helpful. Um, however, if you are um, looking just at the straightforward petrol unit, um, the performance isn't great. It's all right. I'll talk a bit more about it when we're out driving the car. But it's all right, but it's nothing outstanding. The other with it is it's just 37 miles per gallon on the combined cycle on the MP. PG. Again, nothing outstanding, is it? Nothing really to write home about. And with the CO2 emissions, they're rated at 173 grams per kilometre if you've got it fitted with this automatic gearbox. So not exactly outstanding in that. So maybe the plug-in hybrid might be the better option for a lot of people. Right, up on the open road, how does the HS feel? Feels okay, actually. A bit sluggish, 
if I'm honest, 170 ponies um, pretty much to, to haul around this relatively big, heavy sort of like crossover. Um, so don't expect it to be a performance car, uh, and you'll get on fine with it, I suppose. Not to 60, 10 ish seconds, as you'd expect, I suppose, I mean there are quicker cars out there, there are slower cars out there, but you know, it does the job. And that's kind of where it sort of sits. And, and I don't mean that to sound in a, a, a harsh way, but as long as you don't expect too much from the car, then you'll get on fine with that. You know, you've got to understand that it, it is just a sort of like a, you know, medium-sized crossover that's never going to be the most precise driving tool, um, you, know, you know, that you're going to come across. That being said, if you are someone that does enjoy the driving and you need a car like this, then something like, dare I suggest, Kia Sportage, Ford Cougar is probably the cars that you're going to look at for the, if that's the kind of thing you're after over the MG. Um, you know, because there is an element of it, as I say, if you try to do too much with it, it all gets a little bit out of shape and it just all feels, starts to feel, it's like your dad dancing at a wedding, do you know what I mean? It's funny for a while and then after a while it goes, you're a bit, oh, it's getting a bit embarrassing now. Um, other people are doing this better and, you know, it's, it's, not, it's lost its humour at this point. That's kind of it. That's kind of this car. You know, as I say, if you push it too hard, if you, if you try and expect too much from it, it'll fall flat in some respects. Now, the suspension in terms of ride quality uh, is quite soft, so therefore what you also get is quite a bit of lean in corners. So again, that's part of the issue. If you go into a bend a little bit too fast, with a little bit too much gusto, you get a bit of body roll. And the steering's quite imprecise. It's not too light, it's just a little bit vague and imprecise. So you're not really sure what's going on underneath when you're kind of mid-bend. And as I say, then it starts to roll and that's when you realise, oh, I've gone a little bit too quick in here. Now, the plug-in hybrid has a stiffer suspension setup, but that's more to do with it coping with the added weight of the plug-in hybrid system rather than being the sportier drive. So again, don't expect, well, if I'm a keen driver, that's the one to go for. Yes, it's a stiffer suspension setup, but as I say, it's more to do with controlling the weight a bit better rather than sort of like chassis dynamics. But as I say, as long as you don't expect too much from the car, as long as you understand that actually what you're getting is, you know, just a, a, a relatively straightforward family crossover that, that, that's not going to be the last word in driving dynamics, you'll pretty much get on quite well with the HS. As I say, the steering's a bit imprecise, a little bit vague. Um, you know, it's like even although it's not as light as, say, the little Dacia Duster that I was driving this week, which oddly enough, although it's a smaller car, it's a similar price to this, but there's an element of the duster that I think works better for me than this car. But it's nowhere near as light as the BYD Seal UDMI, which as I say, it, you know, it is a good car, uh, you know, but as I say, if you just, the steering is just fingertip light, and that can be quite unnerving in a lot of ways. So it's somewhere better than the BYD, not as good as Hyundai Tucson, uh, Ford Cougar, that style of car. Kia Sportage, yeah, okay. So it's somewhere in there. Um, one thing I haven't uh, done is I've got in this car, uh, unless it's remembered it, because I did turn it off earlier, it's turned off that uh, attention monitor because I think everything comes back on when you start it um, and it's a real pain in the neck because I say you do have to turn it off you've got to go through this screen to do it all and it just becomes such a faff I mean as I say I, I think it's almost slightly more dangerous than um, the, the, you know than did the, the, the I suggest not paying attention it's a really odd thing to say oh there's the other thing that I'm not so keen on either, is the stop-start system. It takes a little while to restart the engine, so there I'm coming out of a junction there, and the guy that was coming up flashed me out, and as you come off the brake, it takes a while for it to start again and then move. 
um, which you know is a delay, and that delay of a few seconds, you know, could make all the difference at getting out safely or not. So be aware of that. There must be a way of turning off the stop-start system. I'm sure there is. Um, so if that is the case, that's probably something you might want to do. Right. We were talking there about the, uh, or I was talking there about the suspension set, the setup. That it's, it is on the softer side. Um, that being said, um, what's going on underneath? There you go. See, that's that beeping thing. That's that chiming thing, and it that, it, it will keep going like that unless you turn all these things off. And the noise just becomes, you know, so distracting. And I know there'll be some of you out there who'll say, well, just pay attention to what you're doing or stick on the speed limit. That's all very well and good, but it's not never that easy in some respects. Right, uh, what was I talking about? Suspension, right, yes. You've got a relatively compliant ride. However, it's um, at low speed, you do tend to feel um, imperfections in road surfaces. So, you know, I've come, I've, I've driven from down in Surrey, I'm up in Oxfordshire now, and I thought, I'll, I'll wait till I'm up here till I give this section of it, because I know I was going to be going down some back roads that are a bit unfamiliar. <laughs> Shush! <laughs> and that's, you know, as I say, you can start to feel the surface imperfections on the road. However, the flip side is, at higher speed, on the more open roads, so dual carriageway, motorways, and that type of thing, it settles itself down. So it's a really nice, comfortable car at higher speed um, than it is at lower speed. It's all, and it, it, look, I don't want to say it, it's uncomfortable. That's not what I'm trying to suggest. And if it's coming across that way, I apologise. That's not what I mean. What I mean is you can just feel what's happening underneath. It's not as well controlled as some other cars in the class again. Um, at low speed, you can just start to feel, you know, as I say, those surface imperfect. See there, coming at that junction, it, it just takes its time. Just to, there's the response you get isn't that sharp, and it it takes a while for the car to react to what you're asking it to do. That's that's the thing that I have to say that I find I, I'm probably going to be the most critical about it. I can put up with the fidgety suspension at low speed because I say it's not horrific. The vague steering, that's okay as well because I say, you know, it's not overtly light, but it's just a little bit imprecise, but it's a family car, da-da-da-da. It's just that little bit there. When you put your foot down, it just seems you're trying to wake it up. You're going, come on. It's like, you know... A teenager, you're trying to get out of bed ready for school in the morning. It's like, it's going to do it, but you just got to take, it's going to do it in its own time. But you want it to do it in your time. You know? See? And once you get it past 4,000 RPM, whilst the performance is fine, once you get it past 4,000 RPM, it starts to get a little bit coarse. The engine just starts to misbehave a little bit and make itself known. And as I say, it's like that grumpy teenager, oh, leave me alone, I don't want to get a bed. That's what it's like. That's the only way I can sort of describe it. It doesn't have to be a teenager, in fairness. I've got a 10-year-old that does that. Um, but you know what I mean? It's just, it needs to be a little bit sharper because, as I say, you're expecting to move off at a junction or a roundabout, and it just, it, it leaves you hanging a little bit. And it, it's not the most precise thing in the world. And again, there that corner, you just that little bit of body roll, that imprecise body roll. So look, it's not the sharpest driver's tool. It's got a little bit of a fidgety ride at low speed, and it's got slightly imprecise steering. But all of that, you can tolerate dare I suggest because you go well you know it's not it's not designed to do anything it's to be a family car and that's fine but just that and just like a little bit of sharper reaction from it and that just makes me hesitant with the car a little bit it's hesitancy makes me hesitant you know to pull out at a junction because I say it, it just takes a little while to respond other than that it is quite a decent car, you know, 
I'm not going to sit here and tell you that you know I'm going to absolutely pan it for all of that because you know some people will drive this and go this is exactly what we want what you know what we well actually no it's what we need as a family and I think that's the difference that's the key with it if you look at it as a car that you're going to need rather than a car that you want to drive then it makes a lot of sense especially for the money there's nothing wrong with it there's nothing intrinsically wrong with this car it's a very decent car to drive is it? and as I say it's a big improvement over the old HS which in itself was much the same a decent enough car to drive if a little bit bland it's comfortable it's spacious I've got a good driving position I've got you know sort of like nice instrumentation in front of me you know uh, all the controls fall easily to hand even using the screen on the move it is a pain it needs to be better but you you know once you get used to it once you know that it's there you can use it fair enough as I say if it was just a little bit sharper on its controls it would be it would be an awful lot better as it is it is a very decent effort if decidedly average for class I'm not sure that I've done a particularly great <laughs> summation there but that's the only way I can say it it's been fine I'm not you know I've got you know a drive ahead of me today I don't mind doing it in this car it's absolutely fine because I know that I can't expect too much from it except for those horrible chimes which really bug me but otherwise it's a decent steer shush Right, with a simple range comes simple pricing, which is always good for me. <laughs> um, okay, so the, the HS range kicks off with an SE fitted with a manual transmission. And that really is quite, I'm not going to call it a bargain, but it's quite headline grabbing 24995 which is not a huge amount of cash for a car of this sort of size and stature. I think that's pretty decent, okay? And I say it's not exactly sparsely equipped. It's a good, well-equipped car as standard. If you want the seven-speed DCT gearbox, this car's got, so the auto um, box, that takes the price up to 26495 So, you know, what's that? Another, you know, another 1,500 quid to get the auto box. The trophy spec, which this car in, is, add two and a half thousand pounds to those prices. Um, so, looking at this particular car here, at 26 and a half, um, sorry, 26 and a half for the SE with the, the DCT gearbox to go to this trophy, that's going to bring it in at, what's that, 29,000 pounds. Okay, still a lot of car for the money, so it's under the £30,000 bracket for a car of this size. That's way less, sorry, police car going past, that's way less than things like the Hyundai Tucson and the Renault Astral uh, that we, we looked at the other week, albeit that's just for the 1.5 non-plug-in uh, hybrid car. Remember I say there's going to be a mild hybrid coming out in 2025, which might be the one that a lot of people do end up going for, but no prices have been announced for that car. The plug-in hybrid, okay, so if you are interested in the plug-in hybrid, well, that's obviously a lot more money. That's, that comes up to 31495 for the SE, but 33995 for the trophy. Now, they all undercut, in terms of those prices, they all significantly undercut most of the main rivals for the car. So, as I say, Kia, Ford, Hyundai. However, it does come very, very close to the plug-in hybrid in the BYD Seal UDMI, which is a much larger car than this. Okay, so it's the same price as that car, and it shows you what a bargain, did I suggest, that car is. As I say, it's a D-segment car, this is a C-segment car, so this is a smaller car than it. Um, of course, with MG, you do get the seven-year warranty um, with a car as standard, so if you're factoring in whole life costs into that, then that is a, a real uh, bonus point as well that you do get with MG. So, we're not going to call them a bargain because obviously, you know, £30,000 is still a lot of money for a lot of people. Um, but in terms of relative terms of the competition out there, it does stand it apart.
Um, and whilst we're on the subject of competition, let's discuss the competition that's out there. Um, there's lots to be fair, isn't there? Uh, as I've mentioned a few of them already, um, but things like Ford Cougar, Kia Sportage, Hyundai Tucson, uh, Renault Stral, the Citroen C5 Aircross, uh, Peugeot 3008, Honda ZRV, the Amoda 5. That's an interesting car that's come from China. Now, I've driven the E5, the electric one of that, over on Auto EV. It was average at best, in fairness, but I'm told the petrol one's quite a decent steer. I don't know, I haven't driven the petrol one. But, as I say, you know, it's an interesting car. It's another alternative. Another Chinese brand that you maybe have to consider as well. Um, now, there's going to be a lot that will offer clear advantages over the MG in terms of like the Hyundai, uh, you know, bigger boot, you know, nice, well, better, well, uh, better equipped, maybe nicer technology inside, better technology inside. Um, but very few of them get close to offering the sort of value for money in terms of overall package that the MG does. So there is a lot to recommend this car. There's no doubt about it, the new MG HS is a marked improvement over the car that it replaces. And that wasn't exactly a bad car. Goodness, it's certainly popular enough, they sold a lot of them. I mean, it's, it accounts for a third of all MG sales, so it was obviously doing something right. But whatever it was that it was doing, this new one takes and improves it, I think, in every single way. It's much better looking. I think this is a great looking car, probably one of the best looking in its class. It's more spacious inside. It has better technology. Yes, there's still some way to go in improving that, but there's a lot of safety tech there that comes as standard, annoying as that may be. It's not perfect. There are probably better cars out there to drive. And in many ways, maybe the plug-in hybrid might just be that better car than this one is. It's not the most exciting thing to drive. However, if you're just looking for a well-equipped, spacious, well-built, comfortable family car that doesn't cost the earth and comes with a good warranty package, then there's very little not to like about the new MG HS. This is a car well worth considering if you're in the marketplace for this style of car. Thank you for watching yet another new car review on House of Cars. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, if you have, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Then once you've done that, press the little bell button down below because that's the way you'll get notified when the next video is uploaded and it's gone live. And there's a lot more still to come from us because there's a lot of cars out there to review. So make sure you're subscribed to the channel. Um, if you have enjoyed this week's video, then give it a wee thumbs up. And of course, don't forget, let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. Do you have an HS? Have you got the old one? Are you thinking about the new one? What do you think of the, this new style that MG have gone for? Is it a good enough looking car now to tempt you? Did you not buy the old one because you weren't sure the way it looked? Or the brand maybe wasn't quite speaking to you enough? Have they done enough to convince you that they now might be worth considering? let me know in the comment section down below. Now, if you're a fan of Instagram, if you're a fan of the gram, I'm there as well, and it's at House of Cars 1973. And remember, whether or not it's a new car or it's an old car, whether it's a small car or it's a large car, whether it's a slow car or it's a fast car, you'll find them all here in the House of Cars. Thank you once again for watching. I'll see you again soon.